Hello again. Okay, so we're gonna be shifting gears now. Uh, I'm just gonna kinda close everything that's open here and make some sense of this desktop. So excellent drawings, everyone. You're now all officially digital artists. And um, all right. So, ah, I totally forgot to show this slide. So this is uh, and actually an important point. If you're ever doing something in the command line and it says that you don't have permission to do that thing, all you have to do is add sudo, S-U-D-O, before, and a space, before the command. Um, so this is a joke about that, basically. Um, good joke. Um, so, we're now going to learn about disk imaging. Um, so why is disk imaging important? Well, disk imaging is really the only strategy we have for doing these things, to preserve the entirety of a disk as it is delivered by an artist, to preserve a backup of a dedicated computer that is integral to an artwork, uh, to boot a dedicated computer in a safe virtual or emulated environment, and also to preserve a deeper perspective of the artist-provided media including deleted files. Um, so this slide here is a screenshot from a blog post by Jason Scott where he's talking about the fact that if you have floppy disks in your collection and you haven't done anything about it yet, it's probably already too late. It's old to the point now where data loss has likely occurred. And this is really the case with all storage media. All digital storage media was not built to last. In fact, it's a miracle that it even works in the first place. Um, so let's talk about that miracle. How does storage media actually work? So hard drives, as you may or may not be somehow aware, are, uh, they use magnetism. So, uh, and really all forms of digital storage work uh, as inscription. You know, when you store something to digital storage media, you're essentially writing it down on a piece of physical material. So we've talked about source code, we've talked about machine code, and we know that machine code is essentially source code translated to something that the processor understands. Um, so when you store something on a hard drive, what does it actually look like? You know, it's not as though when you save your processing sketch on the hard drive, it's writing the letters down. What it's doing, it's not even writing the data, you know, the machine code, the binary of your files on the hard drive. What it's actually doing is when your computer sends information to the hard drive, it does a bit of translation. So let's say that, and we'll go back to that slide note. And actually want to try and resize this because it's showing multiple slides at once, which it should not be doing. Great. Okay. So let's say you have a text file and the contents of it is just the two words, hello world. Now, there are different ways you could actually look at this at a lower level. One way is hexadecimal code. So this is hexadecimal code. Another way is binary code, which is really intended for computers. So this is hello world in binary. But more specifically, it's hello world in binary in the ASCII format. So there's no digital format that's just kind of native, like inherently human readable, even something as simple as just unformatted plain text is a format. And there are numerous formats it could be, but for our sake of this thought exercise, it's ASCII. So ASCII, um, basically, you could think of, you could have a translation document that says like, okay, well, 01001000 equals the letter H. That's a lot of numbers. So hexadecimal really is actually, believe it or not, intended for people. So um, 
if you were a programmer and you were to look up the, the standard specification for ASCII, there would literally be a table where it would be like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then numbers like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you would look up four, eight. So you'd be like, okay, four, eight. And then you would look at it and then there would be the letter H, specifically capital H. So this is just two different ways of looking at it, but really, at the lowest level, it's binary. So now let's say we're storing this to a hard drive. So you're now saving this text file, this binary, in a file system. So a file system is really just the system of folders and directories that we've been working with. Um, the thing is, there are different kinds of file systems. The way of recording this to disk has many different formats, which you may have encountered. You know, you plug in a thumb drive on your Mac and you can read it there, but for some reason you can't read it on a PC, or you may have encountered with the FAT file system, you can't copy more than, you know, files more than like four gigabytes or something like that. So there are various different kinds of file systems. And this is important because your ability to read, you know, let's say a hard drive or a thumb drive or a floppy disk to, you know, let's say you can plug it into your computer. If your computer wasn't designed, if your operating system wasn't designed to be able to understand the specific file system that that given piece of media is, it will be useless to you. You won't be able to read it. So this is kind of another layer of complexity here. We have, you know, the fi file format of the given file, in this case ASCII then you have the format of the file system. So the file system contains the binary of this text file. And you can think of the file system itself as just another stream of binary. But this file system, you know, we're getting pretty low in the levels of abstraction here. And that's even not what's recorded on the hard drive. When the information of that file system is sent to your hard drive, the circuitry inside of it does a bit of proprietary translation before it's actually recorded to the disk. So, you know, binary, as we can see here, obviously is a yes or no state. It's a zero or a one. Now, magnetism, of course, has similar yes or no states, north or south. Uh, however, we don't record this information of the file system on the hard drive as you know, just a verbatim, you know, let's say south equals zero and north equals one, because it's uh, fallible. It's very fallible, in fact. So we need redundancy built in. So let's say we want to record zero. When we send that to the hard drive, it may actually translate that to, you know, north, south, south, north, 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 south, 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 north. And that combination translates to zero, or what did I say, one, it doesn't matter. Um, and so it's actually, and it doesn't really matter as much at this level, but what your hard drive is actually looking for is not the polarity per se, but the reversal. So it looks for what we call the flux transitions between north and south. So when it goes from south to north, it registers positive voltage, or rather your hard drive sends positive voltage. When it reads south to south, or south to north, and so on. Um, so that's just to say we have just thinking about, you know, a dedicated computer or an artist provided hard drive that is an object of preservation in your collection, let's say, a lot of layers of complexity. So when we do a disk image, this is essentially what we capture. We unfortunately can't capture this you know, level down here where we're recording these flux reversals on the hard drive um, because that is just simply inaccessible to our computer. We're dependent on you know, just plugging the hard drive in. So everything that's sent out of the enclosure of the hard drive all of this information has already been translated to the zeros and the ones that are the file system. Um, there are exceptions to this paradigm. Um, there are devices such as the Cryoflux, which if you are working with old floppy disks is very useful because it actually can control old floppy drives and allow you to access them 
at that level of the flux reversals. So it's a very, very low level uh, reading. Unfortunately, there's nothing like that for hard drives, at least on the consumer market. So this is what we preserve when we create a disk image. If you were to just drag and drop a file, let's say you know um, you just you want to do a disk image, but you don't know how. Uh, all you retain is the individual file. You lose all of the information about the file system. And so, what does that mean? Well, without making a disk image, you risk losing file created dates, file last modified dates, file last open dates, file permissions and ownership. Subtle, you know, marginalia such as the placement of icons. You know, how did the artist have the computer set up to look? You know, if we're talking about more of an archival context, and let's say it's just the computer from the artist's studio, you would obviously want to see that as it was seen by the artist. Um, deleted files, and really, just frankly, the context of the whole disk, the files in relation to one another, and the reason you risk losing all of these things is because this information is recorded within the file system. So if you're moving from one file system to another, there's a lot of risk involved there. So before we, and we're not going to be really doing this part hands-on today, but it's very, very important to note, before you can really think about making a disk image of you know, these preservation-worthy uh, pieces of media, you need to be able to connect safely to the computer that you will be making the disk image with. So to do that, we use a device called a write blocker. Um, this is just a picture of one kind of write blocker. If you just Google the word write blocker, you'll find tons of stuff out there. Um, so really, it's just a basically a hardware device that goes between the hard drive and your computer. So instead of plugging the hard drive directly into your computer, you plug it into the write blocker, and then the write blocker is plugged into your computer. And this prevents any accidental modification of the media. And that's incredibly important, especially on Macintosh computers and Windows PCs, because both of those operating systems create hidden files that you as a user likely have never seen, but they do create them, and that can be thought of as, you know, a modification to that media and damaging, you know, its provenance. You know, if this is a hard drive, you know, let's say from Jenny Holzer from 1994, and you connect it without a write blocker, you've suddenly written new data to that hard drive in 2015. And let's say somebody does make a disk image in five years from now, perhaps they'll be wondering, you know, why are there these files? Um, and we can debate you know, on a philosophical level, level later whether or not that's a bad thing. <laughs> but it's easy to prevent, so it should be done. Um, so if you're purchasing a write blocker, you will need one that is compatible with the format at hand. So that means the physical connection interface of the media. And there are various different kinds. So with hard drives, depending on what year you're dealing with, you could be talking SCSI, SATA, uh, PADA or IDE, uh, USB 2.0, USB 3.0, and it's important to note here that although those two are interoperable, uh, you know the USB 2.0 and 3.0 physical connection is exactly identical. And um, however, write blockers that are 2.0 and 3.0 um, do not mix and match with USB 2.0 and 3.0 devices. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's just it's generally unreliable. So if you're dealing with both, you should have uh, dedicated ones for both. Uh, FireWire 400 and 800. And so what does a disk imaging workstation look like? These are two examples. On the left, we have Stanford University Libraries and Academic Information Resources. What they have here is a very um, expensive setup called a FRED. Uh, it stands for Forensic Recovery of Evidence Device. So a lot of the tools that we're talking about right now actually come originally from the criminal forensics world. Uh, this is something that's been written about extensively in the archival field. Um, archives and libraries have borrowed a lot of tools and techniques from the criminal for, uh, forensics world uh, because obviously a lot of the concerns about provenance and um, really chain of custody are similar in the two fields. Uh, and on the right, we have uh, set up at the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities 
as you can see, it's pretty boring. It's just a PC. <laughs> There's really not that much special about the machine other than it's very, very powerful and has write blockers built into the front of it rather than having them separately. Um, so another typical setup, and this is much more common in museums, is disk imaging in situ, so to speak. Um, so here we are creating a disk image actually using our forensics duplicator, which uh, we talked about in the case study yesterday. Uh, not only can this device be used for duplicating the hard drive, but it can also be used for creating disk images, which is different. When you duplicate the hard drive, you're saying, I want this drive to be this drive. When you're creating a disk image, which you know we're going to look at in depth, you're saying, I want to create a data file that is a representation of this hard drive. Um, so this device is nice because it prevents, or it eliminates the need for a computer. So if you have like a complex installation and the computer is like embedded in some part of some object and it's kind of hard to get to, maybe it's cumbersome to get a laptop connected to it, this is a way of doing it. You just connect a hard drive to put the disk image on and you then connect the device to it. Um, this image here, it's a Raphael Lozano Hemmer, and it was exactly that case. You know, the, there was a laptop with inside of this, and to get to the actual hard drive would have been insane, because not only is the laptop embedded in this sculpture, but it's a laptop. So to get to the hard drive in this specific model of laptop, it would have been a, a huge, uh, you know, Herculean effort of disassembly. Whereas instead, what we did is just booted the Mac computer in what's called target disk mode. Um, so disk imaging in situ. Um, so today, we're going to look at three different tools for creating disk images. The first is called DD, which is short for direct duplicate. The second is DD rescue. Uh, and the last is called uh, Gaimager. It's actually really supposed to pronounce Guimage because the guy who made it, his name is Guy, um, he's French, uh, but everyone in the US has decided it's called Guy Major, so <laughs> I feel really bad for him that the, the name didn't really work out. Um, so, DD, um, really briefly, uh, well, actually, no, let's just get into it. So first, actually, before we start using DD, I want you all to do two things. On your application launcher on the left-hand side, you'll see these two little images of, uh, of hard drives. So I want you to click the first one, the one on the top that when you hover over it, it says cat archive. Aww. <laughs> Too easy. Um, yeah, so we've got some pictures of cats. So let's close that. Um, now let's uh, click the Macintosh hard drive. That's the second uh, icon on the left-hand side. Boring. Okay, so let's close that one. So th those are the two hard drives we're going to be disk imaging today. So for DD, unfortunately, uh, it is in the command line. So let's uh, click our command line icon, the terminal in the application launcher. It's our little black square. Um, and I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so we can see the instructions. And bear with me. Okay, you can all still read that, right? Great. So, so the first step, um, before we can even think about disk imaging, there's a piece of information we need called the device file. So I want you to go ahead in your terminal and type in the word mount, M-O-U-N-T, and press enter. Whoa, so that's a lot of stuff. So let's, uh, let's break this down. And I'm actually, I'm sorry to say, going to make the font even smaller so that we can see this formatted correctly. But I think you'll all still be able to read it. And Okay, a little bit better. So when we run the mount command, what it does is it basically shows any attached media to the computer. So any hard drives, any thumb drives that are currently plugged in. So these last two lines here, we see the names of the two hard drives that we're working on today, the quote unquote cat archive and the Macintosh hard drive. So the piece of information that we want, the device file, 
is the first thing that is listed on the line for the given uh, piece of media. So it's right here. It's slash dev slash sdb. So what it's doing here, um, in a Unix-based system, which is Linux or Mac, um, a device file is basically, you know, we talked about the fact that in the command line, everything has a position. It's like everything is very centered around the file system. And that even extends to the hardware. So a device file is basically a location in the file system where a piece of physical hardware has been assigned a location in the file system. That's really all it is. So it's kind of a way of um, your computer saying this thing in the file system is this physical hard drive. Now, this, uh, it says, so it says uh, dev sdb on media slash tech focus slash cat archive. This part is what's called the volume. So the device file represents the physical thing. The volume is um, what contains the file system. So you could have multiple volumes. You may have heard of partitioning. You know, so you could take a hard drive and partition it so that it has, let's say, five volumes. In this case, we only have one. And then type ext4, that's the type of file system. So we're dealing with the ext4 file system, which is uh, kind of less common. It's for Linux, really. Um, but so in any case, this is our device file. This is the thing that we want. So write this down. We're going to need it later. So. Uh, before we can proceed, we need to actually unmount the hard drive because presently what's happening is you know, the hard drive is being served to our operating system. And so we could think of it as the, the physical hard drive is kind of, it's preoccupied, it's busy. It's busy talking to the operating system and serving the file system in the operating system so that you know, we can um, look at it in the graphical user interface and click around and access files. And when you make a disk image, you need its full attention. You need to be able to pipe all of the data out of it. So we need to unmount the drive so that we can do that. So for that, we go back to the command line. And we type sudo super, and this is short for super user do, u mount. So that's not unmount, it's u mount. So U-M-O-U-N-T, space. And now we need to type the path to the volume. So that's slash media. And I'm going to use tab to autocomplete. So if you just start typing the word media and hit tab, it's going to complete all the way to the word tech focus. So it's slash media, slash tech focus, slash capital M, a, C, and hit tab again to autocomplete. And you'll notice that there's, a, there's actually a backward slash here. That's called an escape character. Because the name of the hard drive has a space in it, computers are so stupid that they need to know this space is part of the file name. You know, otherwise, it's going to think that this, you're starting a new part of the command. You're not still specifying you know, the same piece of the same word. So we have sudo u mount and then slash media slash tech focus slash Macintosh hard drive. Enter. It will ask for your password. Now, as you know, the password is password, but don't panic when you don't see anything show up in the command line as you're typing. When you type in the command, uh, the password in the command line, it doesn't show even asterisks. So it's just password all lowercase and enter, and let's assume it did something. No, let's actually see if it did something. So if we type mount again hit, and hit enter, we'll see that Macintosh hard drive is now gone before it was right above cat archive. So that's good. Now, uh, I hope you wrote down your device file because we now can't find it anymore. Uh, but it, no worries. So the device file is SDC, but let's, so let's go back to the command line. Now that we've unmounted it, we need to make the disk image. So let's type super user do, so it's sudo or sudo, s-u-d-o space. So now we invoke dd by typing dd space. 
And the syntax of DD is really in two parts. We need to tell it what data or what thing do we want to read in and what data or where do we want to put that data when we record it. So the first part is what we want. So if we type if equals for input file. So that's what that's short for. And then this is where the device file goes. So the device file is slash dev or dev slash sdc. So that's what we saw when we typed in the mount command and we saw the Macintosh hard drive. So now, after your device file, we have a space and we type of equals and that's output file equals. And so now we're really just telling it where we want to put the disk image and what we want to name it. So let's start with a slash and then type home slash tech focus slash, so that's our user's home folder, and then capital D E S K desktop slash. And so that's the location, that's where we want to put it. We're gonna put it on the desktop. But now we need to give it a file name. So let's name it M-A-C, capital M-A-C, I-N-T-O-S-H underscore capital H-D dot zero zero one. So I'm gonna make this smaller so you can see the full name on the same line. Uh, no. No, it doesn't want to do that. Well, as you can see, it starts on the line up here, but then it continues down. So it's Macintosh underscore HD dot zero zero one. And now hit enter. And you should see something like this. Now, this was very, very fast. Uh, when you disk image, typically it will be very, very slow. So the reason it's fast is because we're working with a virtual hard drive and the hard drive in this case in for our workshop, it's really just a piece of data on the same hard drive we're working on. So that's why it's so fast. But when you're working with an externally connected hard drive that is very large, this process will take a very long time. And unfortunately, this information that we see here, this doesn't display until the process completes. And DD does not, uh, does not output any information at all while it's working. So if you're disk imaging a one terabyte hard drive, it could take an hour, and it will be an hour of it just sitting there, and you'll be panicking, like, is it working? Uh, it's very stressful. Um, but what it says when it finishes is, um, this is how many bytes it read in, this is how many bytes it read out, um, or actually, I guess it's not bytes, because that's a lot more bytes, but records, whatever that is. Um, so this is how much it copied, this is how long it took, this is how fast it was. So that's kind of useful, but um, it's not that great because what we've done is we've just, we've placed a lot of trust in our hard drive. We've just said, let's just read it and record what we read. We don't know if that was actually a good reading because we haven't done something called verification. So verification means reading something once, recording it, then reading it again, and then looking at the two and making sure you got the same time, same result both times so that you know you're not having any failures, any read failures. You know, the hard drive isn't fritzing out, the computer hasn't messed anything up. Um, and also, as I said, it would be nice to have some user feedback while the process is happening so that we don't just sit there panicking as to whether or not it's working. So. That's why we will now look at DD Rescue. So DD Rescue is basically just a fancier version of DD. So let's, uh, let's type mount one more time. And now we need to take note of the device file for the cat archive. So as you can see here, it's slash dev slash sdb. So I'm gonna clear this out. And again, we need to unmount the volume. So I'm going to go back to my command line and type super user do sudo space u mount space slash media slash tech focus. And I really recommend using auto completion here because it's a kind of complicated name. 
And it's really the only thing attached to media right now on your virtual machine. So if you type media and just hit tab, and you have uh, unmounted uh, the Macintosh hard drive, it should all just show up. So it's slash media slash tech focus slash capital C-A-T backslash space capital A archive. Uh, hit enter. So we've unmounted the cat archive and we can verify that by typing in mount one more time. And now we don't see it. So we've unmounted it. So now we need to do super user do, sudo, and now we invoke DD rescue. So DD R E S C U E space slash dev D E V slash S D B. So that's the device file of the cat archive hard drive space slash and um, so basically I kind of I guess I kind of jumped ahead without explaining what we're doing here. Um, so. This is similar to uh, DD in the sense that we're giving it two parameters, what we want to read and where we want to put it. However, DD rescue doesn't require the same syntax. You'll notice there's no IF equals and there's no OF equals. So really, it goes sudo, name of the program, DD rescue, and then the source, which is dev sdb, the device file, and the destination. So we can put these things without you know, any specification, no IF, no OF. DD Rescue just knows that the first thing that comes after the name of the program is the source, and then the next thing that comes is the destination. So we're going to put this uh, at slash home, slash tech focus, slash desktop with a capital D, slash, uh, let's call it, cat archive with an underscore. So C-A-T underscore archive dot zero zero one. You might be wondering um, why the zero zero one. Uh, so raw disk images, which we're, we're going to explain uh, in a bit uh, depth just in a moment, uh, don't really have a file format. It's really just a linear recording of every single byte that is read out from your hard drive. So the file format is frankly whatever the format of the source hard drive is. So because of that, they don't really have a, a file extension, so to speak. They do, but it's kind of, there's a, there's a lot of different file extensions that are used. So 001 is one file extension that's commonly used for uh, raw disk images. And that's really just a convention that comes from uh, certain tools that like to segment uh, disk images into many little files. So they'll name the first file 001, the next file 002. We're not segmenting our files, so we just make one called 001. Um, another file extension you could use in place of 001 is .img. Uh, sometimes you may see .dd. Uh, it's really nothing more than semantics. So changing the file extension in this case does not change the format of the data. What it does change is how your operating system may treat that file, but it's not formatting anything. It's really just semantics letting you know what kind of uh, format this is. So we should have our super user do dd rescue slash dev slash sdb and then the destination which is our desktop and the file name is cat archive dot zero zero one. So we'll hit enter. And so similar output to dd uh, again, it was very fast. Normally, it would be very slow. The nice thing, though, is that all of this output, you see when DD Rescue is running. So it's much more verbose. It's much more detailed. And um, it can also detect read errors. And we're not going to get into it today, but if you look at the manual entry for DD Rescue, uh, and you can do that by typing in M-A-N, DD Rescue. Uh, I'm going to quit it, but feel free to take a look at it. Um, you will see that there are many, many detailed options about what to do in the case of a read error. So you can choose just omit that data. You can choose write zeros in place of that data. Um, so it has many more options. But I'm going to clear my command line. And so we were just talking about raw disk images. So what is that? really mean, like I said, a raw disk image, it's not really, the word raw in this case 
doesn't really have any connotation of how the word raw is typically used in data formats. It does not mean um, that it's inherently a bigger picture or you know, more like uncompressed than other file formats necessarily. It just means it's unadulterated. It's just a linear data recording of everything that was on the disk. There are other disk image formats um, that are called forensic disk images and they have benefits that are designed to meet these shortcomings. The problems with um, doing raw disk images and really the tools, the problems with the tools is that, like I said, we're not validating the disk image. So we don't really know if you know, this recording of the hard drive is a recording of what's really on there or if there was a read error. At least with the DD Rescue, we know there was a read error, but it doesn't really, it still doesn't give any proof of validation. Uh, also, we're not capturing any metadata about the, the disk image and its creation. So we don't know who made it. We don't know when they made it. We don't know what tool they used to create it. We don't have any metadata about the original hard drive. And we're not generating a checksum that can be validated later. So you've heard the word checksum many times over the course of the last two days, but nobody's really explained it. So a checksum is basically the process of running an algorithm against a file and producing a unique string of numbers. So the idea is that if you run that same algorithm against that same file in 200 years, if that file is still bit for bit exactly the same, you'll get that same value of numbers that it, the algorithm produces. So it's kind of a way of checking the authenticity of a file in a sense, because if you can prove that, if you can prove that it hasn't changed bit for bit, um, through this uh, you know, checksum algorithm, that's really your only way of proving this has not changed. Um, that's really brief. There's, that's a, you know, a whole topic we could get into. There are many, many different kinds of checksums. They have relative merits, um, but that's for another day. So, Guy uh, So, step one. Uh, first, we want to launch Guy and you will be so happy to hear the Geimager has a GUI. So let's click the uh, icon right here for Geimager. And you'll need to type in your password, which is password. Very secure. And you will see three things listed here. So um, what we want to do is look, f look for uh, the device file called slash dev slash sdb. That's the one that we want in this case. So that just happens in my case, I don't know if it is on your machines, to be the first thing in the list. So next step, we want to right click on this. Now depending on your computer, um, there, ooh, and I, you know what? Oh, there we go, okay, so on the computer I'm working on, I can right click by clicking on the trackpad with two fingers. Um, but that will likely vary um, depending on the computer that you are working on. And actually now I'm having trouble, oh, there we go, okay. So we want to right click and click acquire image. So we get this window and it, the first thing it asks is what file format. So we could say Linux DD raw image, which is essentially what we were just making with DD and DD rescue, but we don't wanna do that. What we want to do is select the expert witness format. So this is a type of forensic disk image. And you know, you'll see a lot of the stuff here has kind of funny names, you know, like case number, evidence number, examiner. That's because Geimager is a tool that comes from the criminal forensics world. Um, and again, uh, it's, you know, the reason that we use these tools is really just that they are accomplishing a, a similar goal, you know, uh, for, it's often uh, the case that disk images are used in court and in order for those to be admissible, you have to be able to prove that that disk image is a 100%, you know, pure, verifiable, uh, you know, representation of the original disk. So the next, next thing we want to do is um, click this drop down here and just change this uh, value to EIB. And so what we're doing is we're just tricking the software. It wants to segment the disk into many little files. We don't wanna do that. So we're just choosing, um, EIB stands for exabytes. <laughs> so we're saying, well, segment it every 2,047 exabytes, which is 
a colossal amount of data that's like probably the size of Facebook's data center. So it's not going to segment the file. Um, so these metadata fields are, you know, again, they're, they're very, they sound very criminal forensics, but you can kind of get a feel for how you might adopt these in your institution to be more appropriate. So perhaps case number is your session number. So let's say 107.2015. You can really put anything in uh, for the sake of the workshop here that you like. Evidence number, perhaps that is your component number. So not all of you use components in your cataloging systems, but we do, so let's say this is the component number. Examiner, this would be you, so this is your name. Description, and again, it's really all about what your information needs are. So you, if you start to use forensic disk image formats at your institution, you know, I recommend developing a policy and procedure and just documenting this is how we've adapted these fields, so always use it in this way. You want to define the semantics of what is going in there. So the description should be defined internally in your procedure. And then notes, same thing. So image directory, let's, uh, let's just put it on the desktop. So image directory, select by clicking this little button here with the ellipses. And we want to select, let's see, where are we here? The home directory first, let's double click home, tech focus, and then desktop. And what are we naming this? We are, oh, I didn't say. <laughs> Okay, let's just, um, okay, well we just wanna put it on the desktop so we say choose. And so you should all see now the uh, home slash tech focus slash desktop. And let's call this uh, cat archive two. Yeah, let's call it cat archive two. Why not? So then the, the last options you have here are hash calculation and verification. So you'll see calculate MD5 is already checked off. Let's also check off calculate uh, SHA-256. So these are different checksum algorithms like I was just explaining before. So the reason I wanna do a SHA-256 in addition to MD5 is that the MD5 checksum algorithm is not secure. It has been reverse engineered and that means that if a hacker wanted to, they could replace a file in your repository with a picture of a cat or whatever and get it to produce the same checksum algorithm. So you would have no idea that anything has happened. Um, the odds of that are obviously insanely um, small, but it's just you know best practice to use uh, SHA instead because SHA is still secure. Um, there's also the problem of hash collisions, meaning that MD5, the value that it produces, is very short. So if you have millions of files, there's a chance that two files could accident, accidentally produce the same checksum value. So SHA is longer, so there's less of a chance of that. Basically, the longer the checksum algorithm, the less chance there is of collision of two files producing the same value. So we also want to check off reread source after acquisition for verification and verify image after acquisition. So what this means is when it finishes, it is going to read the hard drive in its entirety a second time and then compare that checksum to the checksum that it got the first time that it read it. Um, so that's exactly the kind of verification I was talking about before. So if you have all that, let's click start. Oop, I guess I've never used exabytes before. So apparently that range is too large. So let's um, just change the split size to one exabyte. That's still really huge. And click start. So it says running and it finishes very, very quickly. So let's see what we have here. We've been putting a lot of stuff on the desktop. So let's actually, let's go take a look at the desktop for a moment. So what do we have here? We have uh, Macintosh hard drive.001. That was our raw disk image of the Macintosh hard drive. We have cat archive.001. That's the raw disk image of the cat archive. And then we have cat archive2.eo1. And that's uh, our disk image 
of our forensic disk image of the cat archive, but you'll also see that we have a cat archive 2info and this is metadata that was produced by Geimager. So if we open this by double clicking, it will open in your text editor and you can see all kinds of information that Geimager produces about the disk imaging process. And it takes note not just of the checksums, but of the fact that the disk was verified. So let's close this. And again, if you're having trouble closing it, the, uh, the close button is up here in the top left-hand corner. So that's Geimager. So beyond the disk image. So we've, we've looked at you know, three different tools for creating disk images. We've looked at raw disk images and we've looked at forensic disk images. Um, but there's really more to it. You know, like I said, if your computer cannot understand the file system that a disk is encoded in, it's essentially useless to you. Uh, and that the same holds true for the disk image. So if we disk image something and we store it in our repository, we check some it, we make sure it's a perfect copy for 50 years, if that file system goes obsolete and we can't run it in an emulator or we can't access it any other way, we have nothing. We just have this blob, this data file that's in an un, you know, impenetrable format. So we're going to look at a way of producing metadata, technical metadata about the contents of a disk image. Um, so what we want to do is open our terminal again. And I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. And we're gonna run a program called FiWalk. So FiWalk is a tool that can extract metadata about disk images. So I'm going to do this by typing FiWalk. So that's F-I-W-A-L-K. And now let's um, just go ahead and drag and drop our Cat Archive 2 forensic disk image right into the terminal after you type FiWalk in a space. I can see yours right there, there's no space. <laughs> no, uh, so do a uh, control C to get a new line. There you go, great. Okay, so I'm gonna hit enter, and whoa. So that's, it just sped out some information. So that's cool, what does this mean? Um, before we get to what it means, let's just accept that we want to store this information. We don't just want to spit it out into the command line. You know, this is metadata. Let's say we want to package it with the disk image and store this with the disk image. So to do that, what we do is, first let's clear the command line, and let's hit the up arrow to get our FiWalk command back. And then we just want to add an option to specify that we want an XML output. So you should have FiWalk space the path to your forensic disk image, space, dash, capital X. So this is telling FiWalk that we want to actually output its analysis as XML. A dash? That's a double. Sorry? No, can you spell X with a slash? No, no slash. It's just, uh, just dash capital X. And a space after the capital X. And now we need to, because we have told FiWalk we want to record it as XML, we also need to tell it where we want to put that XML file. So I'm going to type slash home slash tech focus slash capital D desktop. And let's call this cat underscore archive dot XML, and I just want to make sure, yes, okay. So we should have FiWalk, the path to the disk image, the dash X to specify XML output, and the path to where we want to put the XML file. So let's hit enter, and we see nothing happen. So let's, uh, let's hide the command line here and go to our desktop. So now we see this cat archive XML file. Let's go ahead and double click that. So as you can see here, we now have a lot of stuff in a text file. So what is this? So this is 
a metadata representation of the entire file system. So FiWalk is able to go into the disk image and look at all the folders, all of the files, and it basically structures in this you know, text-based format the entire structure of the whole hard drive. It also produces a checksum for every single file in the disk image or on the hard drive. So that same checksum that we have for the whole hard drive, we now also have a checksum for every single hard uh, file that was on that hard drive. So we can now also track the you know, fixity and authenticity of the individual files. Now, let's, um, let's go back here. Oh, nope, not yet. So I want you all to do something. I want you to click this little uh, magnifying glass towards the top of the screen to search. And let's go ahead and type in D-O-G. So what is there a dog doing in our cat archive? And you may recall when we looked at the contents of the hard drive, there were no dogs in that cat archive. What we are seeing here, um, right here, there's an XML value that says unalloc. So that's short for unallocated. And there's a value of one. So it's saying this file is unallocated. What does that mean? That means this file was on that hard drive, but somebody deleted it. So unallocated means that basically the way a file system or a hard drive works is when you delete something, it's not deleted. It's still there. It's basically taken note that if it needs more space, it can eventually write over this file, but it doesn't do that. That's why you, know, you may have heard about when you need to securely reformat a hard drive, you write over it many, many times with zeros and zeros and zeros. Um, the fact is the only uh, real secure way to destroy data is to actually shred the hard drive. And this has been defined by the Department of Defense. Um, so what we've seen here, we've captured not only information about the entire file system, checksums for all the files, but we've also discovered hidden, you know, deleted files. So this is something that is potentially useful or also creepy. Um, so let's let's go ahead and close our XML. And again, you know, because of just the, the length of the workshop, we won't even get into what XML is, why we use it. That's that's a whole other topic. Yes? Oh, I don't know. Let's find out. Mm. Yeah, I don't either. I don't know why either. <laughs> For further research. Okay, so next, we will briefly look at emulation. So we've made a disk image. We can extract metadata about the disk image. We can make checksums. But what if we want to actually, you know, breathe new life back into that disk image? Let's say that disk image was uh, made from the hard drive pulled out of an old Mac computer for an installation or an old Mac computer that belonged to an artist. Um, looking at that disk image in emulation, of course, is going to be inherently more interesting than looking at some XML metadata. So what I want you all to do is double click the purple icon on the desktop called Mini VMAC. And you should see a black screen. And the next thing I want you to do is drag and drop the Macintosh hard drive.001 into the black window. It might not work the first time you do it. Yeah, it's not working at all for me. It's working for some of you. Okay. Show one more time. So what what we've done here is we've taken the hard the disk image from the hard drive of an old Mac 
and we're using an emulator to basically boot that old Mac up, and it seems like it's working for all of you, but not for me. Um, so feel free to take a look around, open up some files, and um, that's, that's really it. Um, so we looked at tools for making raw disk images. Oh, here we go. Uh, okay, so mine's really slow. So one thing to note is that we can only do this with the raw disk image. So forensic disk image formats are useful for things like provenance and metadata, but they're not compatible with uh, most emulators. Um, so you can actually convert forensic disk images to raw disk images. So at least starting with the forensic image is one uh, good option. But I think we're short on time. So uh, yeah, we have five or 10 minutes. Great. Um, so one consideration if you're thinking about forensic disk images is uh, they are all proprietary formats. Uh, the one that we made today, expert witness format, is very heavily adopted. There have been numerous case studies, and it seems that uh, expert witness format is generally the direction the archive field is going um, because it has such wide adoption, and it has been reverse engineered by the open source community. So one example of that is the extraction that we did with FiWalk um, and some of the information that it preserved was specific to expert witness format. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Thanks. So, um, I would just like to say a few thank yous. So first of all, I'd like us to thank the uh, 10 teaching assistants of the Cron Institute who are from the computer science department. So for all of their hard work, please stand up, all of you, and thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Dina Ingle and Mark Heller for their session this morning. And Ben Fino Radin. Thank you. So we're a bit tight on time this morning, but we've got 20 minutes until lunch. I just wondered if anybody had those questions for our speakers. Your brains might just be swimming too much at the moment in Kandinsky software art and disk imaging. Yes, please. Maybe. So maybe if Mark and Dina and Ben can gather here, and I will hand. So if I have a disk image, um, can I restore it onto hardware of any kind? Does it have to be the exact same type of hard drive? Could I extract a hard drive and put it on a USB disk if the sizes were the same? What, what are my limitations there? I'm the runner. So, um, no, yes and no. Um, so in the case of the replica we made for Feng Mengbo, totally different brands of hard drive, same size. Um, I honestly, on the spot, can't remember. Obviously, you need a drive big enough for the destination. I don't think it needs to be the exact same size, but don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, basically, you can actually use DD uh, as the tool for getting it back out. So think of it this way. Um, you have the disk image, you connect a blank drive, you find the device file for that drive the same way we did, you unmount it the same way, and then you use DD in reverse. For the input file, you would use the disk image file, and for the output file, you would use the device file of the drive. Um, Sorry, I have a comment. That'll work if your hard drive is formatted appropriately. D DD won't um, write it out. 
no, it will completely overwrite it. It will obliterate any data that's on that hard drive, including the file system. So the, the, it doesn't matter what format the drive is at all because it will overwrite the file system entirely with the file system that's contained in the disk image. Yes. <laughs> Anything down here? Hang on. So I guess I'm wondering how many artists in your experience for all the museum people are actually annotating their code and if there's any movement to encourage them to do it more often. Well, um, you know, there's a whole diaspora of artists um, and uh, I have to say, Jurg, um, was very precise in checking in all his changes and stuff, and that was refreshing. And he's working with SF MoMA, Martina, to continue checking in those changes. I've seen a lot of code that's not version controlled. I write code too, and um, I didn't version control it as well. Um, I would encourage, uh, I, get, I, I was thinking this through. It's like, okay, if the artist did have version control, like Ben Fry or Casey Riaz, you'd have this great history. If they did it and you acquire it, you should check it in. Um, if you're having communication with an artist, say, hey, you know, um, you know you're gonna give us this binary file. Uh, maybe we could have the source code repository. That would help us out immensely so we could see the history. And so you can have that question with them. Uh, as we talk about this, you know, the, 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 the practice is now in your, your sphere of understanding so you can have conversations about tracking version control. And it would be nice, and it really depends on the artists. Um, uh, Raphael Lozano Hammer, for example, has posted all of his, or some of his code um, on GitHub, so you can download that and you can see the history of um, a level of confidence. So, uh, I can't say it's standard, but it is kind of in software development. Um, <clears throat> I would say in the process of acquisition, you should make a repository if it's not there. And if you get a repository, even better. I think it also depends on the level of artists you're working with. Most of the artists I've been working with very mm -hmm. uh, diligently annotate their code, but they also often know that it's, it's commissioned artworks or it's artworks that might be collected. So. I actually never really encountered the problem of missing annotations. Okay, it's like um, I think it also depends on the situation whether the artist is the programmer. There are artists who hire programmers. Um, that makes a difference in, in general, the level of the programmer's skill. Um, so. A programmer, so Zebrin Fierstig documents his code. We met him yesterday when we interviewed uh, Mark Napier last year here at the Guggenheim. He is a professional programmer for real. That's his quote unquote day job, and his code is thoroughly documented. But it is not always the case. So, all these tools are for Linux, correct? Like DD, DD uh, Rescue, and all that kind of thing for disk imaging. Um, what are options for like Windows and more common platforms? So DD and DD Rescue will also work on any Unix-based system. Uh, if you have a Mac, you already have DD. You're on a Microsoft Surface, so that doesn't work for you. Um, one tool for Windows is FTK Imager, and that has a GUI. It's proprietary, but it's free. Um, and it's actually really nice because it gives you a whole visualization of the file system and partition map before you even do the disk imaging. Uh, that's pretty much the de facto tool for Windows these days uh, within the archival field.
So as a curator rather than as a conservator, sorry if this question doesn't make sense, but I encounter artists who um, set up their systems so that they have automatic shutdowns and restarts throughout the duration of the run of an exhibition. Is it feasible or desirable in any case where the artist might also have an automated system of creating disc images in the case of a generative work where they want to capture the last stage of it before it was shut down and before it's restarted or a generative work that accumulates and continues from one exhibition to another? Is that something we should be talking with artists about doing rather than just doing disc images when it comes back from exhibition before it goes back out. I don't know. <laughs> um, so one issue with disc images is storage. If you have a two terabyte hard drive and you make a raw disc image, that disc image will be two terabytes. So I don't think you wanna be making those every time you exhibit the work necessarily. Forensic disk images are compressed, um, which means that basically if it's a two terabyte hard drive but you're only using five gigabytes on that drive, the disk image will be like maybe six gigabytes. So, but I mean, to step back and actually answer your question, I, I don't know, I mean, honestly I can't really give an answer to that. That's that's a question I think that would be answered by your institution or collector or, you know, and so on. I think that that's a level of, you know, you obviously want the disk image of the computer as received. Uh, if you make any significant changes to its configuration that are absolutely critical to be able to restore, then sure, make a disk image of that. But I think to make a disk image of a computer every time it comes back from exhibition because, I mean, you said generative, but that doesn't really make sense to me because something that is generative, the core software that is executed never changes. It's results that it produces change. So the John Gerard, for example, that's generative, but nothing is changing when you exhibit that. What it's displaying is generative and is gone the second you close the application. So there would be no purpose in that case of creating the disk image. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about, you know, somebody once said to me, digital preservation is all about levels of paranoia. Um, so choose your level, I guess. <clears throat> so the, the first piece I ever worked on was um, Agent Ruby by Lynn Hirschman Leeson, and it was this online uh, persona of one of the characters in her film's techno list, Agent Ruby. And um, there was this artificial intelligence program behind it, and it had a flash interface, and you would chat with Ruby. And it, it was kind of her online AI persona. And so we're, it was on this old computer, and so we imaged it, we moved it to a, a, a virtual machine, kind of like this, and so we could run it on the web and not worry about the hardware. What we found is it had been collecting all the conversations um, that it was having with visitors over the years. And so one strategy we thought, we're like, oh, we should take snapshots, because you can do that in virtualization. So we could take a snapshot, you know, every couple months, so we can keep states of that machine. Now that's not exactly like a snapshot of a disk image, but that's um, an additive work. You had an archive of these conversations, and so that's the strategy we took with that. Okay, we've got another question. Uh, so I guess I'm just, whoa, that's loud. I'm just asking about um, when to disk image and when not to. Uh, the analogy I hear most commonly is if you work at, say, a paper archive or something like that and someone mails you a document, you might decide that the envelope that it comes in doesn't have any archival value. Um, so obviously this is gonna be a case-by-case -case basis, but I'm curious to hear your opinion on criteria for deciding, well, this drive I definitely need a disk image of as opposed to, well, I'm just gonna copy these three video files off of here and move them onto my repository. I've, n I've never heard the envelope metaphor, that's perfect. Um, you know, I think one criteria, one easy one, is how the hard drive is 
provided to you by the artist. So if you know it's coming in a very special teak box and it's you know editioned and autographed and so on, I think disimaging that, even if it's just some video files, is advisable because if you're going to treat that object as something to be preserved, somebody may someday wonder what the file system looks like. They may wonder, was the artist using this hard drive for other stuff or were they just buying hard drives to, you know, there may be questions, technical art history questions later on down the road that can't be answered by the original drive because it no longer works. Now, if the art artist is just sending you a drive with like an MOV file on it and it's in a FedEx envelope and it's still in the packaging that they bought, you know, from Office Max, I don't know. I mean, our strategy has been no. Um, we carefully transfer the files and document chain of custody, you know, so that is still a must, but whether or not, you know, the preservation of the drive in the file system, that's more of a question. We keep the physical drive, but, you know, it's really a storage question, you know. The, the institutional mission in that case would be to actually just access the video file, not to preserve the whole contents of the drive. So it's really, you know, it's case by case. But it's definitely something we struggle with. So with a software-based work, we just do it automatically. With video, we're not really doing it at the moment, but we have that discussion. But we are thinking about doing it with DPX files, but that's for another conversation. Any more questions? Okay, great. I think you've got an extra five minutes on your lunch break. 